that note, I'm just going to start and introduce uh, Dr. Ray. We're running a little early, which is always good. And I think that's because I'd like Dr. Ray to talk as long as he wants, um, because I'm just absolutely thrilled. I'm actually going to read this because it's so much and it's so important. Um, <clears throat> there you can stand there, sir. Um, Dr. Ray is a, is a th thoracic and cardiovascular surgeon with a strong passion for the environmental aspects of health and disease. Found, founder of the Environmental Health Center in Dallas, Texas, Dr. Ray is currently the director of this highly specialized medical facility. The center also has a clinic in Chicago. In 88, Dr. Ray was named the world's first professional chair of environmental medicine at the Rubens, Robbins Institute of Toxicology at University of Surrey in Guilford, England. He was awarded the Jonathan Foreman Gold Medal Award in 87 and the Herbert J. Wrinkle Award in 93, both by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, as well as named the Outstanding Alumnus by Otterbein College in 91. He's also been named the Mountain Valley Water Hall of Fame for work in the field of study clean water, and in 95 he received the Fame Award for pioneering work in the environmental and pre preventative medicine. In 97 he was named the International Man of the Year. That's not a small feat. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, and in 2002 received the O. Spurgeon English Humanitarian Award from Temple University. He has authored a ton of books and the one you need to write down right now is uh, The Optimum Environments for Optimum Health and Creativity. I'll repeat that because you need to write it down. The Optimum Environments for Optimum Health and Creativity. And also co-author of Your Home, Your Health and Well-Being. I have two copies of that book. David Russo, <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, with David Russo from uh, Vancouver. Um, really honestly, Dr. Ray is, is not a pioneer in environmental medicine. He is the pioneer. He really is. And I've had the pleasure of being able to say that I've worked with clients of mine who have been through Dr. Ray's. And I can honestly say from a personal perspective that I've dealt with people who are very severely multiple chemical sensitive. And these people were, you know, the light was going out. And uh, when they came back, the light was there. The light was there. And I was, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, I'm honored that you're here. Thank you. I hope if you can't hear me, let me know. I'm rather adverse to electricity, so I can screw up with a lot of microphones. And uh, of course, I, I got into this in sort of a, a nebulous way in that, uh, you know, the body runs on electricity. And the only thing difference between a dead cell and a live cell is electrical charge. So uh, if we can make it uh, sort of simple, and being a surgeon, I've got to make it simple because I'm not too bright and I can only remember three things, you know. And uh, uh, so if you just remember that, we're all influenced by that, and we're also antennas and, uh, because of that. And so we hear all this talk about what somebody can talk, tolerate and what somebody can't, and we never know because it's individual. And uh, so um, I have a little story that uh, one day, uh, you know, I've shocked many hearts since held them in my hand and shocked them and they start going. It's a real miracle of how that electricity uh, goes. And so we can use it for good or bad, you know. We use it in medicine for electroencephalograms. We use it for electrocardiograms. We use it for electromyograms and so on down the line. Uh, but we also know it can be very harmful at this stage. I'll never forget when I got into this uh, early in the game, uh, some guy called from Parkland hospital, and you know that's the famous trauma center in the world, and uh, he said, Doc, he said, you resuscitated me once, uh, and I got well, and then I went out and had a motorcycle accident, and they want to cut off my leg. Well, I said, you know, if you're going to, uh, you're at Parkland Hospital, they know when the hell a leg needs to come off and when it doesn't, because, because they do everything they can, and knowing the man and some not knowing the man, uh, to save that thing. He said, I don't care. He says, I want your opinion. So he comes over uh, to my hospital, and uh, he's, here, here's a guy with an eggshell of a leg. It looked like an egg had been cracked, all the bones. There weren't just one break, but it was, it was egg all the way down to his toes. And there was pus running out of at least 20 different places. 
And he'd had all the antibiotics and all the potions that anybody could ever think of in that medical center. And uh, I thought, what the heck am I going to do with this guy? So I thought, well, I've heard electricity uh, is a great healing thing. This was back when there were no electrical gadgets for human use other than recordings. So I called up the uh, commissar in Washington and said, I need permission to uh, get one of these electrical uh, stimulators and try it on this guy's leg because, you know, it, it hadn't been approved by the FDA or approved by anybody up there. So uh, they said, yeah, you can use that in that condition. So I, I lined that guy's legs with electrode. And he walked out in a month with a minor limp. You know, and I thought, well, that blew my mind. I, I've seen it resuscitate a heart. Now I've seen it heal wounds that are, uh, you know, unintendable, unattradable. So that's how I got my first burst into electricity in the, in the body. And uh, ever since then, we've been in trouble because of that. Uh, now, there's certainly the electrical sensitivity is a problem that has really come on in the last few years. And, uh, you know, it, it, there's a couple of great books you ought to get. One's by Becker. Uh, some, I think it's Electromagnetic Man, and the other one's by Cyril Smith, which is Electric Man, and uh, those are good uh, uh, things to uh, realize about. Now, what is electrical sensitivity? And uh, it certainly is intolerance uh, to electricity in many forms. It can be transformers in, an, in or outside the house. It can be uh, intolerance to computers. Uh, uh, we have a lot of people who can't tolerate the computers, and you can have uh, it for the wireless now is the big thing, of course, and as we heard yesterday, uh, all those things. Electrical outlets, electrical wiring, TVs, Wi-Fi's, the sun. We have some people who are sun sensitive uh, because of electromagnetic waves in the sun. And then we have other people who are color sensitive. I have one guy who couldn't look at yellow. For example, if he saw that yellow coat over there, he'd collapse. And I mean, just bang, like that. And uh, said, what are we gonna do with this guy, you know? And so we finally worked him out. And he now travels all over the world and, uh, and uh, does very well. So, you know, there are all kinds of uh, different electromagnetic problems. And so when you come and you have people come and tell you they got that problem, you believe them, boy. And then you gotta work around it to figure out what the heck to do for that individual thing. Now, the, the uh, electromagnetic sensitivity can occur de novo. However, about 80 to 90 percent of it um, is uh, preceded by the chemical sensitivity problem or chemical overload. And a lot of times, if you go ahead and, and treat the chemical problem, and that means you've got to treat their food sensitivity, their mold sensitivity, and uh, their chemical uh, problem, and, and of course, the most powerful tool is the house uh, for that. Well, then a lot of these people's electrical problem will go away completely just with doing that. But then there's another group where no matter what you do on that, they've got to have other extraordinary measures to do that. And you know, I've reflected on this uh, most of my life now, and I've decided what we've tried to do is reinvent the cave. And uh, so we uh, go back to uh, treatment of about uh, 10,000 years or something like that, you know. So, uh, well, of course, when we first uh, started uh, talking about electrical sensitivity and chemical sensitivity, of course, we had a little bit of resistance. And uh, what I'd say is that most of my colleagues thought it was crazy. And uh, um, so what we decided to do is do a study on electric uh, sensitivity. And what we did is we uh, got a double screen uh, room. You couldn't pick up your telephone in there. You couldn't uh, call out. Uh, it was uh, screened with steel and then it was screened with the copper. And uh, I've realized that the, you know, the copper and all that kind of stuff has to be really, quote, uh, very small weave so that uh, the, the films can't go through it. You guys know that better than I do. And, uh, then we started doing studies, and so uh, where's the uh, puncher here? I don't have I don't have one. I don't have one up here. He's a live puncher. Well, I'm about you know half in my talk now, and so 
Let's go on. Okay. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Uh, okay, uh, go on. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Okay, next uh, uh, next slide. What we did is uh, next one. Uh, we started uh, had a study where we took a hundred people who uh, complained of being electrically sensitive, and of course at that time, which is about twenty years ago, you uh, had a lot of problems. Wait a minute, you're going too fast now. Say uh, when. All right. Uh, we tried to screen the room as best we could, and we tried to screen the clinic as best we could at that time. So you can go to the next slide now. And we did have, uh, like for example, we found that the TVs, if you could get them at least eight feet from the individual, and have them up about six to eight feet, and then have them encased uh, in uh, different metals, they would, uh, it would work uh, very well, and you couldn't measure with the measuring devices at that time you couldn't measure much, they fell off at about that time. And uh, so that's what we did. Now if we can go on to uh, the next slide. Uh, same with the computers, and what we learned was if you get the computers uh, with a whole long cord on them uh, and get the patient's way back uh, from this, why then uh, a lot of them can tolerate it, and if you shield it uh, also. Now that sometimes I think you have to have a little magnification for some people. Uh, because of that. Okay, if we go on now, please. So anyway, um, we uh, tried to uh, uh, ensure that there was not much extraneous uh, uh, things as, as we could do at that time. And of course, we were totally unfamiliar with materials, so uh, we only used materials for chemical problems. And I'll show you later what we've learned uh, to change these uh, things, okay. All right, next one then. So one of the first phase, what we did is we took 100 patients who complained of sensitivity. And we uh, had them in this cage room. We would sort of depollute them uh, uh, chemically, and then we'd sit them in there uh, after a period of time so their pollutant load was down, and you could magnify your sensitivity so you, you could prove cause and effect. And then we used a frequency generator, uh, just a standard frequency generator, uh, which went from one-tenth, five uh, megahertz in frequency. And then we challenged them uh, off uh, for about five minutes and then off for uh, 10 minutes. And uh, we used some uh, blanks and placebos in there. And uh, so what we found was that uh, a lot of these people certainly did react to electricity. If you go on the next slide, uh, we, we got it down to where uh, there were 25 of them that did not have, react to the blanks. One of the problems with the electrical uh, problem is that when you trigger somebody off, they just keep going on and on and on, you know? And, and so, uh, way to, so we had to choose the patients that didn't react to the blanks at all to prove that this thing existed. And so we had about uh, 25 of those. Now you can go on to the next slide. And, uh, we had the third phase where we did uh, 25 healthy volunteers who had no symptoms uh, that they could discern from electricity, and we challenged them. And if you can go on with that, uh, they uh, didn't react to uh, any frequency and they didn't react to any placebo. So they were a good group to compare these other sensitive people to. So if we can go to the next slide now, uh, what we found was about 70% of the EMS sensitive patients had positive signs and symptoms scores, plus a change in the autonomic nervous system. All the electrically sensitive people had changes in their signs and symptoms. But at that time, we couldn't, uh, we didn't have enough tools to measure the body's response. Uh, but we did find the pupillography, uh, which uh, if I think if you go to the next slide, I'll just show you that, uh, where you could actually uh, measure their pupil response. And, there's a whole litany of uh, about 10 steps that you can do to prove that. So we, we did find that. And if you go on to the next slide, um, we had the fourth phase where we re challenged, where we, the patients had already not reacted to placebo, but reacted to the active frequencies. And then we did them again, uh, just to be sure. Because you have to remember that the, the criticism at that time was rather uh, vigorous, as you can bet. Uh, 
And uh, so what we found was that it, there was clearly electrical sensitivity without any question. And, and that these patients uh, had uh, problems and what they said was true. Next slide. So I always uh, say you always listen to the chemically sensitive patient, listen to the electrical patient. They will tell you they're the best meter in the world. Now the one problem is that the meter can get confused at times. And uh, so therefore you have to have other uh, better meters uh, also that are true, but as you well know, every one of them got a flaw, you know? So uh, if we go on to the next slide now. So the conclusion is where the electromagnetic sensitivity exists and that it's a, a prime promoter of disease. And if you think about it, since the body works on electricity, it's probably the final, final thing uh, for health that if we don't pay attention to, we're going to have problems. And you guys have got the uh, uh, goods in your hand to build good environments uh, to do that. Now, we, we started off, next slide, please. Um, so uh, since then, we've had 1,500, probably now 3,000 patients that are electrically sensitive in all degrees. Now, the question is, what are the other things that can uh, trigger it? And uh, there seems to be a high correlation between that and chemical uh, and metal sensitivity, uh, particularly zinc, copper, chrome, cobalt, next one, uh, stainless steel, titanium, and its alloys, including molybdenum, manganese, uh, magnesium sensitivity. And we've done probably over 500 patients uh, now where we actually, every patient who's electrically sensitive, we test them for the metals. And of course, what we find is, is that uh, a lot of them are sensitive to one metal or so on, and you've got to neutralize it with the injection treatment, and then you've got to avoid it for a while for the people to go down, uh, get their sensitivity down. Now, the other thing we found is now 220 different implants that can be put in the human. And so, you know, we're becoming bionic. I have one guy that's got five different implants on him, and you don't think he might be sensitive a little bit to electricity? Now, the worst, uh, the most common implant are dental fillings. And uh, then we've got uh, artificial jaws, metal jaws. We've got uh, artificial hearts, valves, metal valves. We've got uh, artificial shoulders, artificial plates. We've got plates and screws every place, you know, wires, you name it. And then we've got the uh, uh, other uh, synthetics like the Teflon, Dicron, and so on. These will all contribute to your electrical sensitivity. And if you don't uh, get them neutralized, you may well uh, have problems, even though you've designed your building and designed your house uh, as so, you know, to be as free of uh, electrical problems as possible. They do act as antennas. I'll never forget, I had one girl came in and she uh, uh, had a heart block and she needed a pacemaker. Well, a pacemaker was put in and within 48 hours, every joint in the body was uh, full of pain and she was swollen in every joint, couldn't walk, couldn't move hardly. Well, you know, all the internists and everybody, they gave all the poisons and everything, didn't work. And uh, I thought, you know, it must be, uh, maybe she's sensitive to that pacemaker. So uh, we got all the uh, MSD sheets, which aren't very accurate, but uh, about the best you can do. and. Uh, tested all the metals that was in there, and then the, the synthetic that was in there turned off her reaction just like that instantaneously. She went two years with no medication and with the pacemaker working properly, and then the dang pacemaker failed, which is usually unusual at this day and age. They used to all fail at two years, but now it's you know five, 10 years that they'll work. So she had to put, get another one put in, and by gosh, the same thing happened. And so we got that, and she's now five years. We turned off that sensitivity and that electrical impulses, and she's fine. Her pacemakers work well and it saved her life. So those are the kind of things that we're seeing that really cinches the fact how important electricity is in the body and how we can all become antennas. I had another girl who had a jaw, 25. She was a, had an auto accident. They had to put an artificial jaw on her, a metal jaw. And it was titanium and titanium alloy. And the titanium alloy has a bunch of different uh, 
metals in it besides titanium. So I tested her for titanium, which is the main ingredient, nothing. Tested her for nickel, which is the highest they sensitize, nothing. Went down the line, and I tested her for molybdenum, and I provoked all her symptoms. We gave her the injections of the neutralizing dose of molybdenum. Within six weeks, she was without symptoms. Now, this is a girl who'd been on morphine every three hours for the last several months, okay? And she's been five years now without any injections or anything, and her jaw's fine, and she's fine. So these are how, this is how uh, significant <coughs> the problem can be and how aberrant electricity can screw up these patients and magnetism <coughs> and uh, cause problems. So you go on now. You got me off on a sidetrack here. Okay, now, the other thing is 80% uh, uh, of these people are initiators of the pesticide. And so uh, the w number one and two polluters in the homes are no natural gas and pesticide. They're tied. And this will initiate uh, the electromagnetic sensitivity uh, all the time, okay? So you want to be sure that those houses have no pesticides uh, in them. And sometimes it's very difficult to tell uh, because of the inert ingredient law, which now says you can have DDT in there as long as it's not an active ingredient. And so, and the DDT has a half-life of 150 years, so, you know, you're, you got that to contend with. Next slide, please. Okay. Most of these people have food problems, about 80% of them, because it messes up the food handling mechanism in the brain. There are four areas in the brain that handle food, and so they'll be food sensitive a lot of times. And a lot of these things will made, uh, melt away when you get a proper living quarters for them. That's the neat thing about it, okay? But we do now have uh, uh, blood work, and we do have hair analysis, blood urine analysis, and we actually now have breath analysis where you can measure 600 chemicals, which is a new technology that's just come on. And it really does help us all on what you want to have in your environment at home, you see. And, and we do now have kits that you can send and if you want to evaluate or rate an indoor environment or an outdoor environment, you can uh, draw the air up into these kits, and we've got a good analyzing guy, uh, uh, chemist, who uh, does this. And it's no affiliation with me or anything. We just use him as a technology. Uh, so that's uh, the other thing. Okay, uh, next slide, please. This is just an example. I don't have a pointer here, but uh, you can see uh, with the uh, blood analysis, benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene, xylene, hexane, which will rattle your brain like mad. And some of these act as anesthetics, like cyclopropane is an anesthetic, and yet you have it all. That'll mess up the electrical uh, components of the body. Okay, if we can go on now. And here's an example of a breath analysis with cyclopropane uh, being number one in that patient. Now, uh, where in the heck did she get it, and how are you going to prevent it in your safe environment, you know? Because you've got to do that, otherwise, you know, she's going to be in trouble the whole time. We have a uh, nice new fracking uh, gas field between Dallas and Fort Worth, and that's the big rage right now. You know, we're going to frack uh, our gas into uh, uh, use. And uh, what we found with the breath analysis on these people we found it in the outside air, we found it on the inside air, and we found it in the breath analysis. And what we see is, uh, like for example, fracking has used the hydrochloric acid to frack the, the, the rocks and everything. We found two patients with hydrochloric acid uh, in them. And uh, we found that just whatever was in that gas outside was there, the butanes, the propanes, the methanes, and so on. So you are just to the mercy of your environment, okay? And you've got to, Look at that to do it. I mean, this is a virtual chemistry. I don't know what half these things are. And these are the top 14, okay? <laughs> top 20. And, uh, you know, it, I, it's taken us a year uh, with a master chemist uh, working full time to get computer runouts. So, where are you going to find cyclopropane? Where do you find isobutane? Where do you find uh, no name and so on? Which is neat now because now that we've got that pretty well done. We can say to a patient, okay, now look, are you around A, B, C, D, or where is, find out where that A, B, C, D is coming from. And this will be a tool, I think, for you guys eventually uh, that we can do it. Now that we've got the outside, inside air, 
and the neat thing about this, this is a 300, 350 bucks is all it cost, and the uh, some of the uh, air analysis kits for uh, air are the same or cheaper, you know. So uh, if you guys uh, want those, if you'll, I can't remember the thing 800 number, but there's a girl that uh, sends the kits out and she can get them for you, you know. Just call the Environmental Health Center Dallas or email it or whatever, and they'll, they'll do that for you. It's been a great tool for us, these, these tools. So. Okay, next slide. So um, we certainly know that EM, EMF sensitivity exists, and you need to find the cause if you can. And, uh, uh, you know, in the house, electric beds can be a problem. Heating pads can be a problem. Microwave ovens, you know, so on down the line. Okay, next slide. All right, now some of the uh, techniques uh, available beside the history, go ahead. Uh, uh, are, we just talked about, so now I'm going to go what we can do about the treatment of electromagnetic sensitivity. And a lot of this depends on you guys because you got to, you got to get your homes right. And we know now from uh, um, controlled environments, we've made controlled environments now for 30 years, and we're starting to see all the things. And some of it is just the opposite of what we do for the chemical problem, which of course drives us crazy. Okay, next uh, slide, please. All right, we want to try to get areas away from electrical sources in the United States. Is that possible? And, and it's very, very, very little area. Um, I've got one lady who had to live in a cave for years. She was a real survivalist, and, and she got there, and you couldn't pick up a phone, a TV, uh, anything, any electricity. However, she would go outside, and every time a satellite uh, went across uh, every hour, she would get zapped. And that's how sensitive some of these people can be, you see. Now, we hope not to see too many of those because, man, I'm telling you, that will really drive you crazy. Okay. Uh, some areas, uh, here's one up in uh, Nova Scotia, still uh, relatively clean. I thought I'd put that in for those Canadians who <laughs> have probably had that job. Uh, and here's one in beautiful West Texas where there's nothing but miles and miles and miles and miles. And uh, th that seems to be a less polluted area, if we could go on to the next one. Uh, here's our monitor in the Virgin Islands. I've got a patient who is very sensitive. They build a house out on the Virgin Islands. And uh, one day I get this frantic call, Dr. Ray, I have just been doing great for the last four years. I'm well, I can do anything I want. And all of a sudden something has come in and I can't tolerate anything. Well, we saw, so here's another detective job. So we looked it out, we worked it out. Anybody ever heard of African dust in this room? Okay, the room, the, the, you know, the uh, air blows around the world. Look at Chernobyl. Chernobyl radioactivity in upstate New York and uh, milk and Minnesota and so on, okay, from that. So far we've had a real nice kept secret from the Japan one, but it's all, already the radiations in California and Washington and uh, Oregon. And, uh, so we're going to have that same thing. Well, what happens in the uh, middle of the earth, the, the winds come from Africa. And, and what's in West Africa, of course, is that there's a, a big desert down there, in there. And so you got all the particulates, the bacteria, the viruses, and everything. And she was being made ill by that. That comes in, in from uh, mid-May to uh, mid-September in the eastern part of the United States. It comes up in it goes through Texas, Alabama, Mississippi, and so on. Comes up, hits the Rocky Mountain, bounces off, goes up to New York State, and then into England, and uh, so on. And uh, of course, on the other side, you say, well, you guys are saved in the West Coast, but you got the Gobi Desert coming in from the West Coast. And uh, that uh, hits California and uh, uh, Oregon and Washington, and British Columbia. So, so you got those things that you have to, be a little bit concerned about, know where the wind currents are, what time of year, how often they are in the year, and you can build your houses and build your buildings uh, safely to take this into consideration, okay? Now, uh, here's a nice place in West Texas, uh, probably has been burned down now. 
with all our flowers, you know, next uh, slide. So, if you can find areas that's uh, difficult to pick up uh, Wi-Fi and TV and things, that's great. You know that TV uh, slide where they say they blanket America 97%, but they uh, figured it covered 100% with the, the blankets for the, that? Uh, well, that's what you're up against uh, on these things, okay? Next slide. Um, so areas where grounding is feasible, I don't know, where's our grounding man here? He's probably given a talk on this much better than I can. But what we've learned is that, uh, uh, when you ground, there you go, okay. Uh, what we've learned is, is that uh, most people with electrical sensitivity need to be grounded. And you've got to, it's good for everybody, but uh, particularly these people because they can't function if they don't uh, ground. And so uh, a lot of them have their favorite area they find out uh, where there's uh, uh, dirt and there's no underground uh, caves or underground wires or iron veins or cables or pipes and things like that uh, that can disturb the electrical uh, imprint of that. And you know, it's uh, interesting. Uh, why do we wear shoes? And why do we wear rubber shoes? I look around this uh, place and there's a lot of people with rubber shoes on. And I don't know any baby that's ever been born with shoes on. And I've never seen one. And I'd like to see some because of the fact that uh, there must be a reason for that. And I'm, I'm sure you've covered all this uh, uh, on there, so I won't go into this uh, so much. But grounding is extremely important. And, and the less electrical intake you take, the better off you are, and the less chemical problem, uh, the better off you are that you handle, okay? Okay, next slide. Some of the things, the materials that uh, do in, uh, decrease the uh, toxic load is that the wood, if it's not cedar or pine or terpene, terpenaceous ones, you have to really be careful of that because the terpenes can really cause people to have problems. Ground rods at a, a certain level, and it's varied throughout the uh, United States, or throughout the world, of where you have ground rods. I had one girl, she could not tolerate any of her ground rods they gave reversed electrical charges if it was not exactly six foot in her area. If she went to five foot, she would get charges from it. If she went to seven foot, she would get charges uh, coming in from the earth, you see. So it, it's individualized and you have to be precise. Uh, certainly on the floors, uh, we like them to be a, above ground. Those people that have basements, if it's not moldy, do a lot better. Uh, but uh, in Texas, we got mostly slabs, or we've got them about that high, nice mold generators, and, and they're not quite as good uh, for that. Hardwoods are great. Then you have to watch for iron veins and radio railroad tracks, too, because they can uh, conduct into the earth. Okay, next slide. Um, we showed the computers and uh, TVs how you can shield them. Um, the other thing is uh, twisted wires in the uh, uh, walls seem to help. The other thing I like to do is, if we're building a new building, is not have wiring over the whole room. Just have it on one side, you know, so that you, you at least can protect against that. And uh, the other thing is a lot of times, you know, everybody sleeps with their bed against the wall. And if the wall's got uh, any kind of conductor in there, why it's not so good. So uh, I always have them move out the bed into the middle of the room. And a lot of times that really makes a difference. You know, once you get some meters that really work, you can, you can tell, but I'm not sure about if there's any meter yet that's good. And I'm so glad this group is working on these uh, meters because we really need that. Right now you've got only one meter and that's the human, human sensor. And uh, you have to listen to them and, you know, sometimes they're Integrators uh, get screwed up a little bit. You can't always tell, you know? Okay, next slide. Uh, so hardwood or ceramic floors seem to be the best for the electrical uh, people. And uh, I must say, I was lucky because uh, I was trying to treat the chemical problem. So in our clinic, we have no carpets. And I, in my opinion, nobody should have a carpet unless they wash it. It's been washed at least 10 times. <coughs> and uh, the... Uh, other thing is the wood, wood uh, for the beds. I'll show you what not to do uh, later on. Uh, organic cotton, 
you can't use wool because the sheep are always dipped unless you graze your own sheep while you've got a problem with toxicity. Uh, but silk, it's hard to kill the uh, uh, silkworms if you use pesticide on it. So uh, they don't have it coming out, although the Chinese have managed, managed to mess up all their clean uh, silk right now. It's hard to get uh, in decontaminated silk. Raw hides for springs. Springs seem to be a magnifier. And uh, so that's uh, the other thing that uh, uh, you have to watch out for, although some electrically sensitive people can sleep on them. Okay, next slide. Now, we have, uh, for several years, we used to run a hospital unit for about 20 years, and it got so impossible with all the regulations and all the Obamacare type things and all this that we had to uh, go with the outpatient, which was good for us. So we, we contracted with the Marriott um, by us, and they have to have four buildings, so we just took one building and made it chemically less polluted. And uh, unfortunately, it wasn't all electrically less polluted uh, because we didn't know about it when we uh, did that. We didn't didn't have the good technology that we have today. So uh, we had uh, some anodized aluminum uh, furniture and steel furniture that obviously conduct electricity but we use a lot of glass and our ceramic, which is fine for those uh, people. Next slide. And uh, the beds should not have springs. And again, you should have wood beds for the electric uh, sensitive people. And gotta be sure they're hardwood, not uh, pine or cedar, okay? Next slide. And uh, these, these are, we've had 20 rooms over there now. And we can get about 80 to 85% to 90% of people while just staying in those rooms. And we have a real problem in that some of our more affluent uh, people won't leave. <laughs> and I'm not telling you, I, so my bed, uh, my bed capacity really is not 20 beds, maybe 10, because I've got people there who've been there for a couple of years. You know, we're right off the freeway, uh, which is not a good place to be, okay? Uh, but. Uh, the point is you can make environments, you've got it within your hands to get people well and keep them well. The key is keep them well without, make, without medication, okay? And uh, so that's the other thing. How do you treat people besides the good environment? Uh, well, there are three types of less polluted water. One's spring water, one's distilled water, and one's filtered water. Now, the problem with the distilled water is some chemicals spill over right at the same boiling point as regular water. And so uh, a lot of people uh, can't tolerate that. On the other hand, a lot of electrically sensitive people can tolerate distilled water better because there's no minerals in it, okay? Now the other group is the spring waters with the minerals. It's usually high in magnesium, which is an antidote for the electricity, okay? And so we like to use glass bottled spring water. No plastics because of the phthalates uh, come in and you get a chemical problem. And then some of the filters, charcoal filters and other different kind of filters, ceramic filters, there are some chemicals they won't take out. Certainly organic food with a variety of diet, uh, varied your diet all the time so that you don't get the same thing. Repetition seems to be a problem in the electrically sensitive and chemically sensitive people. And so if you can have things that are not the same day, you don't have them the same day, you have them every four or five days, you're much better off. Okay. okay, next slide. And so this is some of the waters from around the world we've evaluated. Number one best water is uh, uh, Mountain Valley from Hot Springs, Arkansas. They have a two, there you go, she's got one right there. Um, they have a 200, 400 acre uh, park above it where they don't spray. And so far, the water has not become contaminated in contrast to Perrier in France, where they got benzene in the water and had horrible trouble cleaning it up. The number two water is the Avion water uh, from France and Switzerland, and then the German waters, and then the British waters, and some of the Canadian and Mexican waters are there, and some people do uh, very well on, okay? So that's the other thing. And if you're gonna use a distiller, use an all-metal distiller or ceramic don't use the plastic distillers because you'll leach off all the stuff, okay? Next slide. Um, 
The other thing we couldn't live without is about 80% of the people, you can get intradermal neutralization and you can shift, shift their sensitivity back so they're not so sensitive. And it's a great tool uh, that one can use uh, to overcome a lot of these uh, sensitivities. Uh, so we use that also. Next slide. So metals, foods, molds, we would test that way and treat them. Okay. Now, the neurotransmitters all run on electricity, and they are the transmitters that, that transmit the electricity through the body, okay? Glutamate uh, in the receptors is the uh, prime one, although there are 70 other neurotransmitters. I, I don't know, when the good Lord designed this, he did make it so it's rather difficult to keep your handle on everything, you know? And none of us have a handle on it for that reason. Uh, we've got a partial handle on it. And uh, some of the EMF patients, you can't neutralize them. They won't be neutralized for the neurotransmitters. You just have to lower their load and lower their load until they uh, get uh, better, you see. Okay, next one. Uh, of course, so nutrition, every patient who's electrically sensitive and chemically sensitive has a nutrition deficiency. The question is, where is it? What organ is it in? Is it in all the organs? Is it in one specific organ? And how do you deliver the nutrients to make them work, to get to fit, fit where they're supposed to be so that the body can be robust at all the time? And this is a real problem because uh, what we find in electrical people and also the chemical is that they can't tolerate the nutrients they're supposed to have. So you can measure the nutrients uh, somewhat but you can't measure them in the end organs. But then to, to replace them, they gotta be able to tolerate the replacement. So a lot of them can't tolerate their replacements, and so a lot of times you have to neutralize them to get them so they, they can uh, tolerate that. For example, the source of vitamin C is mainly corn in America, okay? Now 50% of the corn is genetically engineered in America, so you have to be careful with your source of vitamin C. The other people who can't tolerate corn you have to give them tapioca-derived vitamin C, or beet-derived vitamin C, or uh, potato-derived vitamin C. And so you have some leeway there. Almost all of the B vitamins are made out of yeast uh, or wheat. And so if you've got sensitivity to that, you'll have problems with that, and so on down the line. Okay, now, increased magnesium. Magnesium deficiency seems to be the soothing uh, uh, mineral. And so a lot of patients need magnesium. It's our number one deficit in patients. And uh, so we like to pour the magnesium to them. A lot of people are constipated, that's great. But uh, our goal is we load them with magnesium until they have loose bowel movements and then back off just a little bit. And that's their dose of magnesium, individualized for everybody. Some can tolerate 200 milligrams, some can tolerate 2,000. And you have to remember that the prime cathartics in this world are malcolm magnesia, which is magnesium oxide, which there's a great insulation now that we've used. So I always say you know, patients, if you go, if you want to, if you're constipated, go to the attic and just eat a little insulation. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, mag sulfate, which is Epsom salts. And so uh, we use it a lot, but we soak them in it and everything. But but the, the others are citrate, and there's aspartate, and there's gluconate, and glycinate, all kind of ones that uh, are tacked on the end that you can try for these people. And uh, then all the other minerals fall in line. You have to supplement them. Some of them, some have deficiency, some don't. Next slide. Uh, lipids and oils uh, you'll have. And you know, some people, their GI tract gets it screwed up. You have to give it by injection or intravenous for a while until it gets, heals the holes in the kidneys and GI tract. Next one. So here you are, the, I, this is just a formula that I uh, give for physicians uh, or anybody, uh, but uh, uh, it, again, it, it's tapered for the individual. Okay, next slide. And here are the minerals, some of the different doses, and, much uh, on here. You'd be surprised how many people don't chew on bumpers. They uh, get magnesium deficient. And it can just screw up your whole physiology, you know? 
So I always give them the choice. They can go out and chew on the bumper or they can go ahead and take some magnesium, a couple hundred micrograms, and uh, uh, go ahead and do that. Now, the other thing is, is if you look at the microcirculation, the, you know, the electromagnetic problem should be called the problem of neurovascular because the blood vessels carry the oxygen to the nerves and the nerves regulate the blood vessels. And there are, you know, four things about breathing. And everybody talks about the three top ones, you know, inspiring air, crossing the membrane, transfer to the tissue. Hardly anybody talks about uh, the fact of whether the oxygen is extracted into the tissue. And if you've got an electrical problem, it may screw up your blood vessels and it, it cuts off the microcirculation which is sort of semi-independent of the heart anyway. You have to have the heart pump, but it regulates its own. And so this uh, uh, Professor von Arden, he's the uh, German who invented the Russians' atomic bomb, in contrast to Bernard von Braun and some of the Americans, uh, uh, rocket people. And uh, he worked on oxygen the rest of his life because he wanted to do something for humanity. And uh, after the Russians let him uh, loose, and uh, so he did uh, work on the microcirculation and developed this technique, which is very simple and you can give in the homes. You don't have to have the hyperbaric oxygen, which just forces a little bit more oxygen into the blood. We go on the next slide. And this just shows what we've got is the old grungy oxygen tanks. And the reason we have that is because the aluminum tanks, the uh, um, plastic tanks, uh, whatever, are contaminated and you, you get chemical contamination with it, and that screws up your microcirculation. So, there you are. Uh, we use ceramic masks or aluminum masks, which we had to generate because you couldn't buy them, you know. And then, uh, if you look there, this uh, uh, reservoir that this person has is made out of wood-grade cellophane, not plastic, so that she doesn't get that. And uh, if you go on then to the next slide, it just shows that up close there. We we'll also use the old mason jars because all the other oxygen equipment are plastic and it'll contaminate your moisturizer when this happens, okay? Next one. So uh, the treatment for electrical sensitivity is lower your total body pollutant load, give your neutralization uh, hypersensitive for hypersensitivity, give your nutrition, say food, water, and air, and then there are a couple other things that happen. Some people get the gamma globulin deficiencies and we give them shots of gamma globulin. And we do this all over the country now. And the problem is, is that the military, any, anytime there's a skirmish, they buy up all the gamma globulin and you can't get it. And so you have to wait till they make a lot more and then, and then get it. The other thing is that we've developed a, over the last 17 years an autogenous lymphocytic factor where you actually grow the patient's own lymphocytes. And as they, as they get, uh, it, it multiplies every generation, about 30 generations. The weak ones die and the strong ones get stronger. And you can fracture that blood and you can be, boost their T lymphocyte. So we use that and that's been quite successful also. Okay, next one. <coughs> then our ace in the hole is Deborah Singleton, who is our, uh, real sensor, because she can see energy like some people in this audience. And uh, uh, some people, I can't even walk into my clinic, I just send them to Deborah first and let her work on them until they can uh, tolerate our clinic. And uh, she can see the energy and she's got the special talent. I think she's the best in the world, but I haven't seen all of them yet, so who knows. And we've worked together for about 20 years. And she can tell you, like that guy that had the drop attacks we see in yellow, she told me, she drew a picture, and he had a wedge through all, all seven layers of energy. And uh, that after he got corrected, that wedge went away. So it was an energy flow problem that we don't understand. So uh, those are the kind of things that uh, we do and uh, on electrical sensitivity. Have you had the next slide there? So, um, sauna. We like the saunas. The 50% uh, of the patients cannot tolerate the infrared saunas. Most of the electrical patients can't tolerate the sauna. So what we do is crank up the heat and at the end of the day shut off the sauna 
and let them go in there. You have to reteach them to sweat because something has gone wrong with their sweating apparatus, and uh, that won't get the chemicals out unless you get them to sweat. My goal is 20 minutes of profuse sweating a day. Uh, you can't give them too much heat because uh, they'll react to that, and uh, that's your other problem. So, and also, we use uh, totally wood and glass saunas, no glue, or, <coughs> next slide, or just, uh, these are different types, next slide, uh, or ceramic saunas. Don't let them, let them sit on towels so they don't get any of it burned in the wood, otherwise the next guy gets chemical coming out. You know how these public saunas are, they all sort of smell and they all I got the, the last guy stuff coming out of it, or the last year's guy, or the last two years guy, or so on. So, in summary, EMF sensitivity can be diagnosed and treated with difficulty, in my opinion. I used to think a chemical problem is a problem. The difficulty, it's duck soup compared to the electromagnetics, unless they've got a cause that you can uh, do something about. 85% improvement with comprehensive treatment. So, thank you very much. <laughs> far away, are we? Thank you very much. Sure. Let's turn it down. Thank you. Yeah, hold on just one second. I'm just going to get the mic. Get the mic working. Checking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. That's. Uh, um, well, it's a lot of information, really. Uh, and and uh, certainly a lot of us have, have been working in the industry, and in the industry uh, of dealing with people with multiple chemical sensitivities and environmental sensitivities. And I can I appreciate the work you've gone into to getting to the point that you have that you can show this kind of stuff to us. And I, I know we're really, really grateful. So pretty much everyone's going to have a question. Which is great um, because you've sparked our brains. So uh, bear with us while we go through the questions, and uh, thank you very much. Dr. Ray, I'd just like to ask uh, if it's possible for us to come and visit. I know yeah. I had the opportunity to come and visit you in December, and that was wonderful. And you were kind enough to show, you know, show us around at the clinic. So I'm sure there are people here that might want that opportunity um, as well. Be glad to have you. Every one of you, but not at the same time. <laughs> okay, raise your hands, folks, and I'll try to get to all of you. There's one guy over there. Thank, you. Thank you for being here, Dr. Ray. My question I'm asking on behalf of someone who couldn't be here today. Yep. Um, what, what are the endpoints of this uh, disease, electrical hypersensitivity? In other words, if it goes untreated, Many people don't even know that they have an exposure or that there's a relationship, so they may, may not even be seeking treatment. But uh, do you um, know that there is a, a, a link to uh, cancer and neurological disease, yes. that it comes as a result of not treating, not intervening in this condition? That's right, Alzheimer's disease, uh, um, pet, uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, just dead nerves in the brain dead nerves peripherally, um, even uh, heart arrhythmias because uh, you can fibrillate because of the electrical problem and, or the chemical problem also. So it uh, goes right on into this. For example, there have been studies done now in Mexico City, which is number one in pollution, okay? And uh, they take all the stray dogs, they've done autopsies on them, find out that the pollutants go up their nose and into their brain. Okay, well that's dogs, okay? So they took the kids that had died of accidents, autopsy them, what they find? Pollutants up in their nose and into their brain. What they find in the adults? Same thing, Parkinson's disease, uh, um, brain failure, Alzheimer's, and so on. And so it, it mushrooms on into uh, medicine. And you know, you've got several sensory areas in your body. You've got them in the lungs, the GI tract, the heart, but you also got them in the skin and in the uh, uh, nerves, uh, the sensory nerves. And so those are your warning systems. And if you think about it, that's what the sensory nerves are there for, to warn you, okay? And so 
uh, that's the telescope into a vast disease that we know today. And yes, there is a, um, I guess you'd call it a, a genetic component, but it's all it is is a time bomb waiting for the environmental triggers, which may take, you know, 50, 60, 100 years. So that's, there, it's, in my, in my opinion, it's really not any problem now telescoping this environmental sensitivity right into fatal disease. And so we've had some where we could, we were fortunate enough to be able to reverse them, you know? Thank you very much, sir. Question over here. Dr. Ray, when you were doing your uh, EMF challenge test on your electrical sensitive patients, yeah. what type of antenna do you, did you use and do you have any information on the field strength where the patient was exposed to that? First question. Yes. Uh, we. I can't remember all the details. I've written that paper 30 years ago, 20 years ago. But we, we made the room as inert electrically as we could, okay, with, in, with all the measuring devices and with the sensitive people who went in there, okay. I used no antennas. We just used the, uh, the old frequency generator. Okay. Uh, next question is, did you challenge them at any frequencies in the high frequency above 5 to 30 uh, megahertz and then uh, beyond that in the UHF and VHF? No, no, we didn't at that time, but we have since then. Of course, they react. Okay, thank you. Fantastic questions there. That's uh, great. Uh, right over here. So I have a, I have a question, uh, uh, Dr. Ray. Um, I've uh, certainly seen that the, the pesticides, uh, as you stated, you know, like the bulk of people who, who end up being sensitive in some way, shape, or form is through pesticides. Um, are you seeing a, a change at all with the, the, the advances and all the electronic stuff that more people are, their initial sensitizing event or sensitizing exposure is actually now an electrical? Yes. And, that, and would you say that number's well, that be I mean, It's hard to say because uh, we get a varied group from around the world. But, uh, you know, 80% of them, it's, it's clearly pesticide generated. About 20%, they're working around electronics, and uh, uh, or they got hit by Wi-Fi or you know some kind of wireless. It's, uh, Excellent, thank you. Sir. I, I think it's increasing without question. Good morning, Doctor. I have a question. As I sit here, kind of looking at this whole thing from the outside in, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people in this room have had individual experiences. And that's kind of what drew them into this space. Where is the medical community as it relates to getting the, the kind of education that I think is badly needed to teach our young doctors that these kinds of things exist and that when people go in with these symptoms, they're not looked at like they're nuts? Because that's kind of what happens out well, there. Well, unfortunately, it's, it's behind. The, uh, we have three physician organizations now. Uh, dedicated to uh, some aspects of the environment. Um, and there are about, uh, I don't know, 5,000, 10,000 uh, complementary docs in the United States now and around the world. Uh, you have to remember uh, a little problem in the uh, clinical part. This is taught in physiology, okay, uh, in anatomy, but uh, in uh, uh, the rest are influenced by. Uh, pharmaceutical companies and by uh, the industry, that they, they're paying for the research and they're influencing the government for the research. And I'm convinced that one of the reasons that we have all this money going into genetics is because we don't want it going into environment. We might find some. That is so incredibly true. Uh, personal story for me, uh, I work with the Environmental Health Clinic at uh, Women's College Hospital in yeah. U of T. Kitty. Which is the uh, best one in Canada for that. It is Red, the Red best Marshall. one. The best one yeah. in Canada, Dr. Kitty Kerr and some of them do great work. Yeah. They have not received an increase in funding since they opened in 1983, and this year they actually had some of their funding cut and lost their intake uh, program director. That's the reality of it. I bet pharmacology didn't have theirs cut. Exactly, exactly. Uh, raise your hands, folks. Marston. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Uh, my question is, 
I've heard uh, a number of publications about what they call the barrel effect. Yes. We, each, we have a barrel of toxicity. Could That's you explain our concept, the, yeah. Could you explain the barrel effect? Sure. Then? And I always look at everybody as a barrel. Thanks, Marcia. So uh, you guys are all barrels around here. <laughs> and and it, uh, what it depends on is the barrel is filled by whatever's in your environment, in air, food, and water. Simple, air, food, and water, okay? So any pollutant in there, and that pollutant can be chemical pollutant, it can be virus, it can be bacteria, it can be mold, parasites, so on down the line, okay? And once you fill your barrel up and you uh, get one more drop of something, you'll, you'll spill over into disease processes. And that's basically what it is. So our goal is always to keep a person's barrel sort of half full, you know, or less, so they can tolerate anything that comes along because you know, in your phase of life, you get hit with all kinds of things. Sometimes they're big things, sometimes they're little, but you can a lot of times control the little things and keep your barrel drained that way. That's all that is. And that analogy was coined by this man, the yeah. Rain Barrel Effect. Excellent. Michael? Good morning. Hey. I'm wondering if we can have your uh, your presentation as an electrical final. If I could, you can have your my presentation. Yeah. Well, I thought you had it, Scott. Where's the part? I just, I'm just okay. confirming that you know. Absolutely. Wonderful. And that, it's out there. Good. And the next question is, this study that was done 30 years ago. 20, I think. It was. 20 years ago. Was it published? Yeah. Really? If you, uh, if you will, uh, email our uh, clinic there, uh, my secretary can send you a reprint. Wonderful. And have there been subsequent studies published as well? Yes. Uh, I haven't published them, but a lot of people have published some. Yeah. OK. Thank you. It was uh, obviously underreported. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, just real quick, I know you say everybody's individual and everyone has different symptoms, but have you noticed any sort of a theme or has anything um, uh, grown over the years so that it's there's some sort of a thread or common theme going on with ailments and well exposure pain. to pesticides is without question overwhelming exposure to natural gas cook stoves particularly and sometimes heat okay those are the two biggie and the third one which is down the line just a little bit is formaldehyde mm -hmm. and, and so those are the three and then now all of your uh, computers and you know, phones. Uh, like, for example, I have a young physician, about 35, trying to raise her kids while she's practicing medicine, which wasn't too bright, but, uh, you know, she was top of her class. And uh, we, uh, when she came down, we did a spec brain scan on her, and she had a hole in her head right here where she held the phone. And it took about two, two to three years to get her cleared up, uh, you know, before she was really functional again. And so, uh, yeah, that to me is a, a sort of discerning thing. And then, and then real quick, talking about a mother with children. Um, so years ago I had a lot of illness issues and did homeopathic remedies of clearing out toxicities. And then I also worked on my son who had the potential of being within the autism spectrum, although now he's, um, he's not. He, things right. have been cleared. And he said to me, Mom, building biology does not make sense because buildings cannot reproduce. That was my conversation uh, last night. <laughs> so, um, but in that regard, is there anything going on to educate maybe the people that have the sensitivities that also have children to help mitigate these issues that we have with all of these autistic and uh, Yeah, issues? there's a lot of educational things. Uh, Dr. Rapp up here in uh, Phoenix, Doris Rapp has written, uh, I don't know, a dozen books on this and, and uh, has all kinds of stuff for schools and, and things. She's absolutely tops on trying to educate people uh, with that. Doris, that's Dr. Doris Rapp. Yeah. And she, she has a huge amount of information online. Dr. Doris Rapp, R-A-P-P, -P. Google that one. Dr. Ray, you mentioned that uh, magnesium is one of the highest efficiencies. And I yes. noticed you had up there both the citrate and aspartate uh, types. Yes. Are those the two main ones you use? and? Well, we'll use uh, citrate, aspartate, gluconate, and lysinate. And does everybody Depending on what the patient can tolerate, okay? Sweet. And we'll also use uh, mag sulfate, uh, but you can't do too much of it because it gives you diarrhea right away. Yeah. 
So everybody's different. You just have yeah. to find what works best for them. Just remember, malcolm magnesium is mag oxide, so you might get some there, but most of it goes right through you. Uh, it's appropriate to also ask, uh, do you have any comments on uh, magnesium oils, topical application? Magnesium what? Oils. oils and magnesium, yeah, coming from Poland there. Those are good. We'd like those. They, they, they have a natural well in there in Poland that seems to have a, some kind of oily magnesium, and it, it's absorbed real well. It works good. All right. Do you work with children? Do you treat do children? What? Do you treat children, work with children, or only adults? Oh, I treat anybody. I'm a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming over there. I'm getting there. How high up on your list is mold for the, uh, as a uh, something that causes chemical sensitivity? Absolutely, one of the prime generators. Okay. So molds and mycotoxins. Uh, that's why we treat for that and always test them for that, because a lot of times if you don't get the mold or mycotoxin under control you don't get the thing under control. And there are a lot of docs out there now are sort of getting it about molds, and they'll just treat drugs for mold, but they don't treat the mycotoxin and do the process and neutralize them. And so th th a lot of them are unsuccessful for that reason. But uh, mold is a prime. Look, this is nature's way of disintegrating, right? The whole earth. Don't forget that. One of the most potent toxins uh, known. Mycotoxin, just what I ta talk to you with the, the avoidance, the nutrition, the neutralization, uh, shots in the sauna, sweating, and things like that, avoidance. So with that, with that process, certainly for those of us on, on this side of the fence who are actually in the homes, yeah. and how do you uh, interact with or engage with the actual living environment of your patients? Absolutely, you have to, you have to evaluate it. It won't work. We always we always have mold plates, and we ship those out uh, in the car loads uh, for our, our patients. Uh, I don't like the mold spore counts because they don't really tell you uh, what's growing in there. They tell you what's uh, going through it, you know. And so, and you'll see now there are so many companies going to spore counts, and uh, spore counts won't give us the information we need to know. We've got to have the uh, mold plates because. What's growing in there is a big thing. And of course, you know, there's the black molds, uh, uh, which uh, are usually aspergillus and uh, stachybotrys and uh, the uh, rhizopus. And uh, they're, they're devastating for uh, some people. And if you don't treat that, you won't have it successful. And a lot of times, if you have electrically sensitive people who's got mold in their house, if you don't clean up the mold, forget it. You'll never get them well. I don't care how well you do on electricity. Uh, on the other hand, you've got to be sure they're not really a mold sensitive because if they are, even when you clean up the house, a lot of times they can't live in it, I suspect, because of the mycotoxin. And one thing we don't seem to have now yet is the uh, levels of mycotoxins in the uh, indoor environment. Uh, technology is creeping up on us here, but uh, that one of you guys need to develop that. Let me know as soon as you do, because I'll do it. Yeah, you had invited us over. Pardon? You had invited us over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so then there's I'm I'm on about two events, and one is five o'clock Tuesday. Five thirty. Five thirty Tuesday. Yeah. What happens? Well, we yeah you know, we'll show you around the clinic anytime. Yeah, but you said you had a group with staff meetings and. Five five thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Tuesday. Five thirty. Yeah. Yeah. Every week, your staff Every goes week. around and discusses yeah. things, and you're inviting. Yeah, or we have outside presenters. Or, yeah, and yeah. so you're inviting us if you're in town at that time. Yeah, come, come on over in. 5:30 Tuesday. You want to give a presentation? Give there it. You go. <laughs> <laughs> and the other is is that your annual uh, conference. Can you describe that some? And well, we've had 28 world conferences. We're not having one this year because we've had too many other problems. Uh, but, can you describe the general format of it? Well, the general have format is year. like here. Hmm? The general format is like here. Papers, discussion, discussion, and more discussion. Because uh, when you get people in from all over the world, they got different ideas, and they, everybody wants to massage them. Right. But, but the other thing is it's like 150 doctors from yeah, all over oh, the world. Yeah, also building people and whatever. 
So that's another one. So watch out for him on his website, etc. And he has that. That's in June. Generally in June. Yeah. June. So watch his website, and if that happens, and if he can make it to Dallas, then that's another. I went to the one all the way back. What, it was 95? A long time ago. I can't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> I went to his thing a lot. How can I forget? How can I forget, I forget, I forget, I forget what he came? Huh? Right? <laughs> you didn't take a picture. <laughs> that was it. We didn't have a picture. He may not have ever even been there, you know? I think Dr. Ray gets the game. <laughs> Dr. Ray, there's a, a veterinarian in Wisconsin whose last name is Croft. I think you know yeah, him. Yeah, Bill Croft. Right. right. And um, he has a protocol for using ammonia to get the mycotoxins yeah. out of the house. Yeah. He has people take ammonia baths. No way. So I that's, just wanted that's to where ask. Bill and I disagree. All right, uh, but spraying the homes—they mist their houses with ammonia. Well, I have no problem with that. And I, so how are they I, able to tolerate the ammonia? I know it, it's they supposed can't, to be. They can't be there. Okay. They're dependent on a dissipate. It's just like ozone. You know, you want ozone in the house, you can't be there, and you got to no. wait till all that ozone. So it does is gone. totally dissipate then. It will. Those are things that are dissipate. That's All right. right. Okay. But I, the other part I disagree with Bill because he's going to create chemical sensitivity. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But there's a lot of people doing it. So yeah. I just wanted to see what you thought yeah, of it. You're Thank right. you. Yeah. Doctor, um, there's obviously over the years, past 15, 20 years, been a major increase in autism, uh, asthma, cancer. And it appears, you know, when we were younger, we, those diseases were really that prominent in, in our society. But now when you look at technology and uh, the use of uh, you know, cell phones and, and things of that nature, uh, there's obviously, from my perspective, a link. And my question is this, because when you talk to people about the issues that are out there in terms of EMF and molds and so forth, um, what studies are available in terms of for example, the link between the proliferation, the increase in proliferation of molds and all these other chemical things that are going on in the environment that we can share with our clients to show yeah. that this is certainly an issue that's out there. Oh, you're exactly right. And actually, one of the, the few good things the federal government does is that uh, if you look at the EPA uh, manuals, they'll have something on all of this with uh, all the current literature and everything. So you can get those free and uh, give them to your uh, uh, patients or your people and you can teach them on it. The literature is absolutely overwhelming. I just finished my cardiovascular chapter of my new book and my assistant came in there and she said, we're not putting any more references in this cardiovascular chapter. And I said, why? She said, you've got a thousand and that's enough for anybody. <laughs> and I'm not gonna do any more. And I think she's right. I mean, you know, how many, what constitutes proof? <laughs> the eye of the beholder, obviously. One other question that I have in relation to spores, you talked about uh, spore count with air, air samples. Uh, we do know that uh, they can be inconclusive at times. Yeah. Um, you mentioned yesterday when we were at dinner that you uh, actually do culturing. Yeah, uh, you, our foundation has, sends out mold plates to people all the time. You want some mold plates? We'll send them out and read them for you. The question that I have is that uh, based on Bible versus non-Bible spores. Yeah. And um, you, you don't know, do you? When you do right. Work on. Exactly. So the issue there is, is that if you're going to try to culture something, right, you may not be able to pick up what's actually there. That's right. And uh, non-Bible spores can be a major health issue. Absolutely. Yes. You can be sensitive to them. See. Right. Yeah. So at any rate, um, I appreciate your comments. Thank you, you so the much. Nail on the head. Excellent stuff. I had to, yeah, I had that similar, similar question as to Bible and non-Bible, and and certainly my mycologist talks about the mycotoxins still present in the in the in the dead spores, and and yeah, yeah, fascinating. Next, yep. Dr. Ray, on the question of electrical hypersensitivity, the scientists uh, that I've been working with who are uh, publishing all the time about biological and health effects, uh, say very conservatively, well, the jury is still out to prove through scientific means, you know, 
that uh, uh, by looking at weight of evidence and, and having official policy review, that there is a relationship between electromagnetic fields and, and electrical hypersensitivity. That's where they stand right now, which yeah. is really unfortunate. It, it's, I think they're straining at the leash, in fact. Well, they, um, always, they always do. Any official always does that. Right, and There's so. There's never enough proof. But then we have the court of public opinion. Yeah. And uh, I just wanted to say, if you, you must realize this, but just in the last week alone, we've had a, an amp up, huge amp up of public opinion in the form of two major television, one was TV, one was newspaper. Uh, BBC World ran a story about the people living in West, uh, Southern West Virginia and Green Bank. Yes, that's right. Nikki Fox and Diane Scow were both interviewed about, they're very credible witnesses yeah. and personally affected. Secondly, this morning's New York Times, which is an international edition, has on their website, and uh, you know it's in the, p the paper itself, beautiful colored photographs that were taken by a woman who herself is sensitive to chemicals and electricity, uh, taken around the world of uh, people showing what their lives are like, what yeah. their daily lives are like, and yeah. their haunting photographs. Oh, it's, it's a real tragedy on some of them, you know. I'm I mean, when it comes to mind, I got a girl who's living in a cabin, wood cabin with dirt floors, you know, and, and she comes out to visit this now. She can do it, but before she couldn't even do that, you know. So there's some real tragic cases like that, and, and they're right. I mean, it, it's coming on. It's mushrooming. And, you know, there's a lot of good work being done in England. Dr. Cyril Smith and uh, Dr. Jean Monroe at Breakspear Hospital, where, uh, they, they are really leading the forefront there in Europe. And uh, they found all this same thing. So uh, you, you're right. The knowledge is starting to get there. Starting to get out, out into the general population. Yeah. And I, you know, I'm convinced that uh, uh, probably our friends in the military have uh, uh, already gotten ways to neutralize some of this stuff. And, you know, like if we can ever get them to speak for us, uh, that'll be great because uh, uh, we know they've got advanced weaponry that they've try to counteract in different ways and everything, so. I'm gonna ask some questions about the, uh, the medical part of your work. Yeah. Okay. You, I heard intradermal injections. Yes, I showed a picture of it. And you showed a picture. Right. What are these? How are they prepared? Well, what we do is it will take, let's say, if we wanna test beef, we'll grind up some, cook some beef and grind it up, you know? And then we extract it with this filtration so it's uh, sterile and mix it with uh, saline and then make dilutions one to five, one to five, one to five. And uh, then we will give a dilution and see if we can provoke symptoms and signs. And we have various ways of measuring them and uh, see if they grow. And uh, so you can do that with uh, any kind of element there is. And then if you take uh, things like uh, toluene, xylene, very toxic substances, you can dilute it down and uh, get only the electromagnetic imprint and inject them. And by gosh, it'll reproduce symptoms. And uh, so you can quantify and you can manage, semi-manage all these things so you know what the heck you're doing partially. So it's like a skin test. Yes, it is. Huh? It is a skin a test, yeah. It, but it's a graded one. It's done uh, um, analytically, okay? Great. And then um, it appeared that for some of your patients, you did intradermal injections for treatment. Yes. So how does that differ from the, from the testing? To well, what you do is you try to provoke symptoms, okay, or right. signs. Say you get a fast heart or you get a blood pressure goes up or something like that. And you keep diluting it and you get the right dose and there apparently is a a window in there where you can neutralize that substance. Your heart slows down, your blood pressure goes to normal, whatever, and your symptoms go away, and you treat with that. So it's so it's somehow like that accesses the body's electricity and uh, work. I'm you know that's for you guys to work out. You're smarter than I am, and know more about electricity, but uh, that seems to work that way. So it's like a homeopathic. It's like a homeopathic. Uh, some of it is like homeopathic. Some of it's allopathic. I mean, it crosses the bridge there. And, um, and, and you do this for uh, chemicals and pesticides and heavy metals, the same? Heavy metals, we do that for molds, with mycotoxins. 
We do it for foods. We do it for, uh, uh, actually, we have some, you know, like I said, some that has electromagnetic imprints only. And, and is any of your testing what I would call like bioresonance? I don't use the bioresonance machine, but some of my colleagues do, yeah. Okay. And it has a similar efficacy? As not quite as much, good, not as good a percentage uh, yield. And I think the reason is too much interference. From most of them don't shield their rooms or anything. Thank you. Excellent questions, Michael. Here, I'll just stop. Them. Dr. Ray, uh, I think you have uh, unique expertise in, in uh, cardiac as well as uh, environmental medicine. I just wanted to draw that link, if you could briefly. I don't know, you've probably talked about this for hours yeah. uh, between uh, cardiovascular disease and yeah. uh, the environment and what we might as building biologists uh, do to. Oh, I'll tell you, that. it's, it's absolutely staggering. Uh, the the uh, cardiovascular because the, what happens to, when a pollutant comes in the body whether it's electromagnetic or whether it's a chemical um, the first thing that happens is you you trigger the uh, initial response to the body which is the release of adrenaline and of course that constricts the blood vessel and gives you lack of oxygen to that particular small tissue area okay and then a whole litany of, uh, of metabolic events occur to try to neutralize this or try to accommodate it or try to park it if they can't uh, detoxify it. So, so uh, that can then spill over into uh, what's the most common cause now, uh, common symptom in, in cardiac is what we call atrial fibrillation. Seems like half the population has come down with atrial fibrillation now, which is just an irregularity of the atrium, okay? Well, a lot of times you can find the triggering agents now and you can neutralize them and stop them. And I, I mean, I've got people that have called me and say, hey doc, every time I go by the microwave, I get my heart failure up. Every time I go by a TV or every time I go by this or that, something uh, flares up, you know. Well, um, you don't want that to flare up too much because the uh, next thing from atrial fib is ventricular fib, which means death. And all you have to have is a run of about uh, 10 of those and you're, do you're done for. So you, you would like to uh, uh, keep that at a, at a minimum. And uh, then the other angle is the pumping chamber, okay. Well, the pumping chamber is semi-autonomous, but it does run by electricity. And I, I'll never forget, I had this old lady who came in from Hawaii, 70 years old. She couldn't walk from here to here across the room. And uh, she had, was on all the uh, famous uh, cardiac drugs that uh, there were, and uh, she really needed a heart transplant. And uh, they said, no, nah, we've not given anybody a heart transplant uh, at that age, you know, because the hearts are too premium. She's lived her life. So basically what they did is gave a death sentence to her, what I call is Obamacare. And uh, then what they, uh, what we did is we worked her up for, for foods, for chemicals, molds, and uh, electromagnetics, and uh, her heart started shrinking down in a controlled environment. She got so she could uh, walk a mile a day, and she's been walking a mile a day now for five years in Hawaii. She sends me macadamia nuts every year. <laughs> <laughs> Best thing, okay? We're gonna take one last question with the leadership here. Um, Dr. Ray, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Uh, your concept of analyzing the air quality or the comp components of the air in the breast is pretty intriguing. Yes, it Could is. you uh, elaborate a little bit on the methodology? Because I assume that you have the, you mentioned outside reference, inside, indoor reference, and then the components which are in the ex exhaled breath. Yeah. Um, how is that actually done uh, procedurally? Um, you mentioned something about a test kit. So can yeah, you elaborate well, on that a little bit? Well, I, as much as I can, but you gotta remember, I'm not too uh, good on the chemistry part or anything like that. But as you know, uh, or maybe don't know, uh, the breath analysis has been um, delayed for years because of the fact of the moisture uh, in the air that the lungs put out. And so what happens is, is that, uh, uh, you know, some guy in Germany measured benzene some guy in America measures isopropane, and somebody else may, will measure ethanol, and that's, that's it. And they have an elaborate recirculate device that they develop 
This is Masana Corporation in New Jersey. Uh, and what they've done is they've incorporated all the best things they can do from GCMS into that, okay? And uh, they uh, can now measure 600 chemicals. And I found it very efficacious when you compare it with the kits for the indoor and outdoor air. Uh, unfortunately, it has to be done in a physician's office yet. Whereas the kits, they had Gregor tubes and other tubes that you collect the air for 15 minutes, an hour, whatever, how long you ever want it, okay? And then they run it through the GC and MS. And this is done by a corporation in Dallas that's worked with us for years. So basically the patient has to go into a research facility where they directly exhale the, so the breath, breath into, the, into the GCMS. Yeah, well, it's not to, no, it's just a collecting device. And I, that's why I think they're going to get it so it's practical so everybody can do it, okay? Uh, but you got to remember, uh, at one time they just gave us the chemicals. Well, big deal. I got to release the chemicals. What does that mean, you know? And I've got to know where to find it and what it is. So we've spent a year developing computer sheets so where you can do it. And they're incomplete yet because, as you know, we're, we're ubiquitous when it comes to chemicals uh, and the like. But it's a neat thing. And so, you know, you guys can do, take the kits and do air outside, air inside if you need to and, and do it. I mean, gosh, I, I found one patient just uh, not long ago who had eight different aldehydes in the, her hair, uh, her house analysis, indoor analysis. There was no question what was causing her problem, you know? And we had to start uh, rooting out all the triggering agents for those aldehydes. Excellent. Outstanding question, Peter. Grateful for that. Uh, for those of us who do sampling, um, it was on my mind as well. Dr. Ray, truly and honestly, on behalf of everyone here, we can take up the entire day talking to you. We're so grateful. Thank you very much. We would be happy to have you back. Thank you very much, Dr. Ray. So for the 25th anniversary conference, we're just going to have Dr. Ray talk. <laughs> and we'll have twice as many people, and it'll take twice as long, and it'll be twice as fun. Thank you again, Dr. Ray. Uh, ten minute break. We're running a little behind, but I don't think anyone's complaining. But quick break if you can, folks. Be right back here in your seats. <laughs>